If I say the name Shang Long, what comes to mind? Maybe you think of Street Fighter's Fei Long, a character inspired by Bruce Lee who shares part of the same name. Or maybe you think of Dragon Ball's Shenron, because the wish-granting dragon's name sounds even closer. Shang Long is one of the most powerful characters in the Street Fighter universe, capable of firing energy attacks with one hand, igniting enemies with flaming strikes, and even using the techniques of other fighters. But there's a catch. Shang Long doesn't actually exist. For the Street Fighter fans of the early 90s, there was no name more mysterious than Shang Long. If you saw a dude wearing a gi in your local arcade back then, he definitely knew all about it. Well, hey man, I wear this because it's comfortable, okay? And yes, I do know all the rumors. So let's talk about them. Because even if Shang Long isn't real, he still has a rich backstory and a legendary status. One that stretches from 1991 to now. We're gonna trace that timeline, speaking to people who were there for the origin of Shang Long and people who still feel his influence today. Let's begin in 1991, when Street Fighter II hit American arcades. Ryu's victory statement should have said something like, you must defeat my dragon punch to stand a chance. But thanks to a mistranslation of some Chinese text, it instead said, you must defeat Shang Long to stand a chance. Kinda sounds like he's naming another character, right? This was corrected for the Super Nintendo port of Street Fighter II, but it was too late. Rumors were already circulating about this mysterious individual named Shang Long. It also didn't help that the SNES game's instruction manual straight up named him as the master of Ryu and Ken, the faces of the franchise. It was only a matter of time before someone capitalized on those rumors with a well-made prank. My name is Ken Williams. Uh, most people don't know me, and that's the best part of what I used to do, is that I used to be uh, the reviewer known as Sushi X, the red gaming ninja from EGM. Ken didn't invent the Shanglong rumor, but he did create the Electronic Gaming Monthly article that shot it into the stratosphere. Let me just apologize for everyone who lost many, many quarters. Yo, you're lucky I don't hold grudges, man. It's amazing to hear how such a simple joke started out. If we were ever going to do a spread on Street Fighter, I'm the one who's going to do it, and nobody else got to touch it. We actually got the actual JAMA board, which to me was the golden opportunity to just do get as many screenshots as possible, blow out blow out some spreads, you know, some spreads and then have, you know, just as much data as we could fit in like a 16-page spread kind of thing, right? Just just go to town. We had also been getting newer versions of Photoshop. I, I had a little spark of inspiration. I'm like, "You know what? It sure would be really cool if there if Shenglong actually existed." So I'm like, "Well, why don't I just take some of the best shots I can merge together with, you know, Photoshop?" and just see how it turns out. Like kids on Christmas Day, Ken and the team continued playing with their toys and brainstorming how else they could manipulate the screenshots. Ray, who, who uh, is one of our colleagues, came up with an idea of putting uh, the fist from Bison, uh, where he's doing his little energized punch, and we, we took that off of him and we put it on and, create, and changed the coloring of it, made it look like a, a flaming dragging punch. Making the moveset believable was a big part of the process. Because as Ken tells it, Capcom had always put serious thought into how its characters execute their attacks. The move sets were actually intuitive. If you ever look at the, even from the original game, the way that you were meant to figure it out is that you're actually triggering the moves at, during parts of the animation. Look at Kyle, like, you know, you're, you're, you're turtling, right? you're pulling back and you go forward, right? And then he goes forward with his, you know, with his sonic boom. Flash kick, down, and then you go up and kick, right? It makes perfect sense. So even though this fake Shang Long was absolutely stacked, there's still a level of believability there. Sure, he could throw fireballs faster than Sagat, kick harder than Chun-Li, and use any character's special attack, but that makes sense for a super secret legendary figure. With abilities like that, the qualifications for just meeting him had to be high too. We're like, how can we make it just sound ridiculously hard? but almost plausible for, because there's, there's people that could play Street Fighter 2 and they were just like gods at the game. The answer was simple, with a lot of quote marks. 
you had to play through all of arcade mode as Ryu without taking a single hit, then last 10 rounds against M. Bison without receiving or dealing any damage. At that point, Shang Long would boot Bison off the stage and take over. Not impossible, certainly not easy, but believable. People actually sent us letters saying that I did every step that you had in there and nothing happened, and we're just like, oh. In hindsight, it is kind of hard to believe, especially when EGM tipped their hats right there on the very same page. The call out for April Fool's submissions is right underneath Shang Long. The other obvious tell was that the uh, Martin Lessey, he came up with the, the, the fi one of the final tells was just, uh, it was sent in from uh, Waste Tokens, W.A. Tokens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, from Fooled Again H.A., which doesn't even exist as a state. Wait, that's not Alaska? It's not. But once the rumor mill started spinning, it couldn't be stopped. The Shang Long Guide was reprinted around the world, fans dumped quarter after quarter to try to see the legendary character for themselves, and Street Fighter fandom was forever changed. You see, while the legend may have begun during Ken's era at EGM, it didn't stop there. In fact, its influence on real Street Fighter games was almost immediately felt. Street Fighter 2 Turbo introduced Akuma, one of the biggest bad guys in the whole franchise. If you did well enough in arcade mode, he'd replace Bison as the final fight. Getting to the end with a high enough score would do the trick, and you can bet that anyone doing a Sheng Long run would hit that high score simply by playing well. So the obvious question is, did Capcom do that on purpose? Oh, 100%. Absolutely. <laughs> Capcom has never outright confirmed this inspiration, but it does seem too close to be a coincidence. It wouldn't be the first time Capcom embraced the myth, nor would it be the last time EGM perpetuated it. The magazine's 1997 April Fool's article once again set the spotlight on Shang Long, who was said to appear in Street Fighter 3. This time, we got the martial arts master's bio. His real name was said to be Gokin, as a play on Akuma's local Japanese name Goki, because the two are brothers. One-handed fireballs and unblockable super moves were on the menu as well, but for my money, the best part of the whole article is the art. This rendition of Sheng Long in the Street Fighter 3 style fits in perfectly with the rest of the cast. That was all done through uh, Mike Vallis, one of my colleagues, super mm -hmm. talented guy. Fast forward 11 years to Street Fighter 4, and Capcom decided to take the April Fool's prank into its own hands. On April 1st, 2008, it made its own joke announcement of Sheng Long, complete with a character silhouette. Some might say that whenever a joke goes mainstream, it loses its humor. And by the same token, an April Fool's joke that gets adapted by the actual developer of the series might be viewed in bad taste. It was. Okay, I lied. I do hold one grudge. Many fans did not take kindly to being teased by a developer who had the power to make the myth a reality. But not everyone hated it. I thought it was amazing. I was looking really forward to it. At this point, we're, you know, we're in, you know, I'm not, uh, clearly I'm not there at the magazine, but I was following this uh, religiously because I'm like, this is just, this is going to be really cool. Shang Long is, of course, not actually part of the Street Fighter 4 roster. And yet, his legend was still strong enough to fool some new players at the time. I am Persia. I'm a host and commentator and competitor sometimes for uh, fighting games. My personal main most favorite game is Marvel vs. Capcom, but my very first fighting game ever that I started taking seriously and competitively was actually Street Fighter. And I fell in love with Yang. Yang is like amazing. I love the style. I love like his speed, his pace. I liked his game plan. He was mix up heavy. The beauty of urban legends like Shang Long is that you can almost always get a newcomer to fall for it. And that's exactly what happened to my friend Persia. A couple of my friends who were teaching me at the time thought it would be funny to kind of like troll me and be like, yeah, you can unlock this character if you like do all these extravagant things. And of course, I'm new to it. I like definitely tried for like a whole day. And then another friend came in and he was like, why are y'all trolling like that? Why are y'all making her play this? You know, it's not real. And like, he kind of burst the bubble for them. They were like, no, we were going to see how long it's going to take her to figure it out. And I'm like, oh, I'm so offended right now. <laughs> you might wonder how someone could fall for the trick so many years later. And the answer is simple, believability. It's the same reason that Ken's original prank worked so well in the first place. 
It's that unquantifiable level of credibility where the idea seems just reasonable enough that people are gonna go for it. It didn't sound outside the realm of possibility because, you know, I also was checking out games like Puzzle Fighter and stuff like that. And, you know, they showed me how to get access to Akuma, actually. There's Akuma again. It's funny how Capcom more or less introduced him in Street Fighter 2 Turbo as a response to the rumors. Maybe they will actually add his brother at some point. Goken wins! Oh right, they did. And wouldn't you know it, his name actually is Goken. It's weird to call him a newcomer given his age and experience, but Ryu and Ken's master did indeed finally debut in Street Fighter 4 as Capcom's true response to the Shenlong legend. From a mechanical, narrative, and even a meta sense, Goken was the perfect addition to the roster. I think he's super cool, um, annoying to fight, <laughs> but I really loved watching like high-level players play him. Shine from NYNC played him for a while, and like I feel like he had all these tools from other characters that might not have been as great as the characters that he got him from, but mixed together as a whole, worked out for him. Variety in playstyles is important, and Goken capitalized on that by having a wide range of techniques. This makes him a complement to the pre-existing characters that players had grown accustomed to for nearly two decades by that point. From a narrative point of view, he also fit right into the story and tone of the franchise. He's Ken and Ryu's master. Easy. He's Akuma's brother. Makes sense. Capcom was already weaving together all sorts of stories about rivals and families. I actually am a huge fan of lore-related things, like and the way that the characters intertwine with each other. You know, I keep going back to Yun and Yang, who are obviously brothers, but like Chen Li is their aunt. You know, they're all connected. Like everyone's family, you know, getting a little Vin Diesel up in here. We're all family, you know? <laughs> but we're all about to throw hands at the same time. Even if you take a step back and look at the Shang Long legend up to this point, there are some behind the scenes parts of Goken that also make perfect sense. For one, unlocking him required you to first unlock Akuma which only happened after some perfect wins, just like the original EGM prank suggested. Taking Akuma through arcade mode with the same qualifications would then bring him face to face with his brother. They just took that little bit of lore and they expanded upon it. And just the fact that they did that is still really cool. It gives you those member berries. You get the whole, you start feeling the, you get that feeling again. And you're like, oh, let's just check this out and see what it is. Yeah, there's a lot to love about Goken. It's clear that Capcom put plenty of TLC into making the legend a reality, from the way he plays, to the way his story is told, to the way he's actually integrated into arcade mode. For Ken, a lot of that joy is once again centered around how Goken actually feels in action. The most brutal super in the game, by far. There was something about the bass tones and just the, just the thud of, it, it's just like it felt so heavy. <laughs> Oh, bro, I felt that one in my gut. Well, maybe the story's just giving you butterflies in your stomach. I mean, it does make me feel warm and fuzzy. And it leaves me with an obvious question. Will Capcom ever put Shang Long in a Street Fighter game for real? Part of me is like, it's free real estate, right? But at the <laughs> other end of it, the novelty of it having this long legacy of it being a hoax and them giving their subtle nods to it without officially doing it, I think that serves a higher purpose. I have to agree with Persia there. For Capcom, showing restraint means preserving a legend. After all, what could possibly match up to literal decades of rumors and hype? Goken is the closest thing we ever got. And for Ken, the whole experience got him pretty close to fulfilling a lifelong goal. Nothing would have probably made me happier at that time of my life to be hired by like Capcom. It was so much fun. And because it was it was a collaborative effort too, it's like you take a spark, just a little spark, and then you, you infuse more creativity into that and then it ballooned into what it has become today. Again, it's one of the things I'm most proud of. And he should be proud of it. This entire video exists because of a joke he made with his friends at a magazine one time in the 90s. Since then, it's grown into the biggest legend in the fighting game realm and one of the best stories in all of video games. I didn't even touch on the movie or comic books or the real slash fake profile that Shang Long got for Street Fighter V. 
it definitely won't be the last time we hear about him either. The spirit of the hoax is worth keeping alive. And I think that's why it's kind of just lasted this long. And then the fact that the game itself, you know, you know, Street Fighter itself has embraced it as much as they have on top of that, I think adds a lot to it. I hope you'll embrace it too. Buying into the hype of Shang Long, appreciating the original joke, tracing the legend as it grew over time, it's all part of what makes video games such a wonderful art form. The fighting game community has something to rally around, and for such a competitive crowd, having that shared sense of victory is priceless. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. Special thanks to Jason up there for hooking me up with Ken. If you like what Framework is doing, definitely hit that subscribe button in the middle. It would help me out an awful lot if you do. And if you want to see what we've already cooked up, you can hit that link on the far left. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.